In this episode, I'll be reviewing The Rules of the Game, which was released in 1939. This was directed by Jean Renoir. He co-wrote the screenplay with Carl Koch. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing some of these great names correctly. I'll name some of the stars. It's a very large ensemble cast. Uh, Marcel Dalio, Nora Gregor, and Paulette Dubost. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. For those of you who haven't seen the rules of the game, or if you haven't seen it for a while, I'll give you a brief synopsis. A bourgeois life in France at the onset of World War II, as the rich and the poor servants meet up at a French chateau. I was very lucky recently to be invited on Mike White's podcast to Projection Booth Podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts, to review the rules of the game. And I took it upon myself to do a bit of a crash course on John Renoir because I must admit, up until about six weeks ago or six, seven weeks ago, I had not seen one Renoir film. And I saw many of them and even reviewed one of them recently. Boudou, Boudou Saved from Drowning, which I really, really loved. Uh, and I've just fallen in love with Renoir's films. And I could see why he was such a fantastic filmmaker. I can see how much he added to the language uh, of cinema, how much he added to the development uh, of cinema, and how sensitive he was to people and his insights into people and even his insights into things that were to come, which you can certainly see in this film right before World War II. It's hard not to watch this film and think of the Holocaust, which was just about to happen, particularly the scenes when they are hunting rabbits and shooting rabbits simply for sport and for, for nothing else. So Renoir, uh, at this point, really was seeing society change, changing and, and people changing so much, becoming apathetic and, and conceited and superficial. I mean, that's part of human nature as it is, but he, this was just getting worse and worse and worse and worse from, from his point of view. And so we see the characters in this film acting in ways which are ludicrous <laughs> and are they're acting in ways which are uh so extreme uh, which 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 adds to the farce of the the piece because it's it's a heavy plotted film and a lot of these different stories going on are happening at the same time and so my feeling is if you've seen it once you haven't actually seen it you have to have seen it at least twice and i'm intimidated to review the film i feel like i don't have a right to review the film unless i've seen it 10 times i've seen it twice now and i've gone back to uh look at different moments and i've also uh, read andre bazin's book who wrote this fantastic book on Renoir, loved Renoir's films. And when this film came out, it, it was it was banned. Uh, people insulted Renoir and it really hit Renoir hard. I feel that it was that it got that reaction because he was hitting a nerve that was true, that that people didn't uh, want to look at. Now it is considered one of the greatest films ever made. But it it's 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 challenging to review because He's using farce, he's using satire, he's using impressionism. Uh, you know, we all know his, his father was the great impressionistic painter, uh, Auguste Renoir, and he was highly influenced by in impressionism. And so with impressionism, of course, you get, you, you're, you're trying to capture your, a feeling of a society or a people um, and your impression of it as opposed to trying to capture a more realistic look. And as Bazin says, you can go, out, I mean, what's realistic to me is different from somebody else. So you can approach realistic ways in all sorts of, all sorts of ways. And so he wasn't interested in psychological motivations or 
uh, possibilities of why people would do what they do and so that the audience gets a better understanding of the motives. He is he is interested in themes and 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 feelings. And so in this film, you really have to look at, OK, well, I don't necessarily know why these people are doing what they're doing all the time. I mean, of course, sometimes you do, but it's it, because it's a farce. What they're doing is so outrageous that to nail down a motivation, you're going to be going down a rabbit hole. You're going to be you're going to wind up like these poor rabbits in the film uh, who get killed. And so you have to just go with what the characters are doing. And then from there, when you when you if you're reviewing the film like I am, my impression was like the best way to go about it is just just look at the characters, just look at what the characters do and what that says about them and and what kind of themes and feelings come from that. So a lot of the behavior we see adds up to themes, it, themes in this film like apathy, uh, like, you know, narcissism, um, superficiality, murder, uh, lust, love, uh, truths, lies, uh, performance. But performance in the in the sense to make one look good, um, and not being connected to to people, not having a feeling for people, racism, uh, not looking at as at people as humans, but looking at them as as w your idea of their ethnicity, which is the definition of of racism, which we see a lot in these films, which which is of course. Racism, you know, you look at someone and because of the color of their skin or their religion and you'll say, oh, they must be acting this way. They must act this way or they must act that way uh, because of your idea or what you know about that religion, which, again, is 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 based on a stereotype or something that you read. And so you're not seeing the people as individuals. And so we see that a lot in this film. So, you know, let's let's take it upon ourselves to look at the characters. So we have uh, Robert, played by Marcel Dalio. He's, he's brilliant in it. He's married to Nora Gregor, who play. Sorry, he's married to Christine, played by Nora Gregor. And she's uh, she's a foreigner. She's, she's not French. And so she has now married this very rich, rich man who clearly doesn't work, who clearly, uh, well, they don't get into what he does, but I think he likely inherited uh, everything he has. And so Marcel, uh, sorry, and so Robert is is having an affair with this woman, uh, Genevieve, which has been going on for two, two or three years. He's been he's been cheating on his wife. And his and she doesn't know about it. And so he has this moment of consciousness suddenly where he feels he has to break off the affair and be loyal to his wife. And the thing that's interesting about uh, Robert is is his ego, for one thing, because uh, at a certain point, what we see is that this man, uh, Andre, who off the, at the top of the film has just uh, flown his plane over the Atlantic Ocean, and he broke record uh, broke a record for how long it took him to do it, and so he has done this for a love of a woman, and that's Christine, who Robert is married to, and so he feels that she wants to be with him, and we don't know for sure whether that's true or not, which I'll which I'll get into uh, in terms of Christine's characters, because you never know where the lies end with begin with these characters and where the truth starts or whether there's any kind of truth to what they're saying. But uh, at a certain point, Octave, who John Renoir plays, he's sort of the mediator between uh, these two, the, the this love triangle here. And so he goes to Christine to say, you know, maybe you should invite him to this party that's happening at this chateau. Uh, he seems to think that you two are in love. And she's like, no, no, I'm not in love with him. He's taking it the wrong way. And so he wants to as a he wants to invite Andre to this chateau. And so Robert uh, finds out about it and he says, well, you know, if she loves uh, if they love each other, then we'll we'll put it to the test. And he's and that's not the exact line, but he's confident that I got the impression he was confident that she would still love him. And so when later on in the film, when he sees that. Um, she now loves him, loves Andre and wants to uh, uh, go away with him. They get into this big, you know, he gets into this big fist fight with him. And so his ego is clearly fragile. He says one thing 
and then he reacts in in a different way he clearly wouldn't be okay <laughs> with his wife just leaving but he is again he is disconnected from people and and he's in his own world and so for one thing the first scene we see with this hunting of rabbits that again is pointless they're doing it purely for sport um he says to one of the men who work for him uh, Shumache uh, played by Gaston Modo, as a man who works for him, and he says, well, how many did you kill? And Shumache says, 250, and he goes, that's all? And so it's like, that's all. Um, and why kill these rapids? Again, Renoir doesn't tell you. They're doing it for for no reason. And so he's he's not, he has no feeling for animals, for nature, for people, and at the same time, he is obsessed with all these gadgets. He's He's making all these uh uh singing toys and and he's and he's obsessed with uh electronics and and so the 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 most concern he shows for anyone at a certain point is a screw that has gone loose and he panics when he can't find the screw again missing screw uh there's a connection there i'm sure that was intentional on the part of the screenwriters and that is what he is most concerned with because it makes him look good. And at the Chateau, they're putting on these performances and he has these, you know, these toys and gadgets, uh, these electronics uh, singing and dancing and he loves it. And you look at that and you think, wow, how much this film was actually showing the connection with with technology and how technology can consume you. And here we are. 2022 2023 people are taking selfies left right and center people are on instagram posting left right and center or facebook and tiktok and we are disconnected from the world in a sense we are uh living on our phones and we're not listening and looking at the people around us and i put myself in that i am guilty of being on my phone a lot and so it's so interesting when you see this film and you see the connection with technology and how that can make you narcissistic in a sense, and how that can make you uh, more and more obsessed with something that is outside of the world. And so you see that clearly, especially with Marcel as uh, Robert, as he is concerned the most with his gadgets as opposed to anything uh, else around him. Um, so again, you know, what are the themes that are brought up there and the feelings, you know, uh, narcissism, selfishness, disconnected from humanity. Um, again, it's, and it's done in these exaggerated, uh, farcical ways, uh, as this love triangle between him, Andre and Christine. Now, Christine is a really interesting character because for her, for me, um, her, she has more of a conflict between, this need for consumerism and money and things and and uh, a connection to people. And so off the top, she asks her, um, the woman who works for her, uh, Lisette, whether she's having any affairs. And, and it seems like in this society, affairs are normal and, and having extra mar marital affairs. And she is married to Shumache. And so she's asking about this and she's she also asks whether you can be friends with men and and Lee said says friends with men yeah right when pigs fly and so you don't know why she's asking this I you really have to watch it again to, to you get a better idea of what was on her mind and again like I said Andre off the top when he is uh breaks this record and he lands and he's on the radio and you know he's so devastated that Christine is not there he felt that they were in love he said he did this for all of for her and that's the first thing he says on the radio I did this for a woman uh <laughs> and and so he's the he's the man who of uh, the rules of the game he breaks the rules you know the rules are clear what are the rules the rule they're not calculated rules or set down rules uh but clearly the rules are if you lie uh, sorry, the, the rules clearly are that you you lie, that you perform, that you are superficial, uh, that you show quote unquote class, whatever that means. And so all of these rules clearly are for superficial reasons for to look good at all costs, even if you have to lie. And here's a guy who breaks those rules, who only tells the truth, who is only genuine. 
And what's interesting, again, about Andre is that, uh, you see, I said I was going to talk about Christine. I'm going on Andre. But when you talk about one character, it leads to the other. So, again, bear with me if if, uh, if this is a challenging review to follow uh, because there's so much going on here and so much to him unpack. But what's what's fascinating with him is the review I did the other day. Um, the, one of the men, one of the the people on the review felt that he, that he was like a naive character, and I was. It's true in a sense because he he follows his heart all the time. He follows his instincts, and you know he's the one who gets killed at the end. And so w- he saw that as being naive. But I I I feel that there's truth to that. But I think Renoir was celebrating the fact that he in this film is the best character in a sense because he is the one who is honest he tells the truth he follows his in- instincts he has a conscious uh, he has co- he's connected to his, his consciousness he knows the difference between right or wrong and where these these characters don't even know the the, the difference between right and right and wrong uh, they've lost any kind of moral center and so he is the one who is the who is connected to his morals the most and what happens he gets he's the one who dies uh, right at the end which of course I'll get to but with Christine it's this conflict between um, you know being being connected to people and being also this this need for things and then again you don't know for sure how much she needs all that she's that people say she needs i mean it's only other people who say she needs a lot of money for example uh robert says to andre later well you can't be with my wife because because she needs a lot of things you don't have enough money now is he saying that out of jealousy is he saying that to stop the affair you don't know but with her i mean she even goes to lisette her servant and and asks don't you want children um, don't you, and again, uh, inquiring about the affairs. And so she even later on talks about how people lie so much and, and how awful that is. And, and Octave, who Renoir plays, says everybody lies nowadays. Um, and he earlier says the tragedy of life is that everyone has their reasons, which is very true. Like every people do things for their own reasons, which add up to some bad, bad behavior and, and bad, bad actions, which, we certainly f- see in this film, even if their reason is is to just uh, kill rabbits for fun. Uh, that that's 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 the tragedy is that we have a reason to do what we do um, for 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 bad and mostly in this film for bad <laughs> for bad reasons. Uh, unless you're Andre who who goes with his heart, but I felt. But at the same time, um, we do get a sense of how she is. Um, n- really disconnected from people and and can't stand to be told the truth because what we see in the beginning is that when the radio comes on and Andre's talking about uh, he did this for a woman she just shuts it off right and again it's this interesting thing with the radio is that the the radio uh almost has these these bits of truth but because it's being you can control it by just turning it off you don't have to hear it and we we later see Robert also turn the radio off you know, it's like there's some truth coming from the radio. What does he do? He puts on one of his singing his singing toys that he's made, which, uh, I, again, uh, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with these with with these uh, with these gadgets that he's made. But in, in, in this film, it's it's sort of it's used in a sense to show that that is a. A, a need for entertainment it is a need to say look at what i've made look at what i've done and and at the end at the end of the day there are these gadgets that sing and and dance and are there to entertain and so again it feeds into the 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 performance as lies and that oh well if i hear the truth i'll just turn it off and another interesting thing is that where when we hear the truth it's always in the darkness you know, it's as if that when the truth comes out, no one can hears it. Or if they hear it, they can turn it off. Because when Andre lands, he is, is it's nighttime. And so the radio, you know, the, the radio stations are there. And when he tells the truth, it is, it is, it is night. And so uh, who heard that? I mean, every, people heard it, but they could have turned it off. Whereas uh, all these lies that we hear are out in the open. So it's like, it it's gives the illusion of truth because the day is when people can hear all of these things. But really, what we're hearing is a pack of lies out in the open, and the truth is in the dark, where it's falling on deaf ears. We later see that at night, when Octave 
has this moment of truth come uh, from from him as well. He sees himself as this as this failure in life, and it's also in in darkness. Um, and he and it's almost set up like a stage uh, outside. It's in this wide shot where he's talking to uh, Christine, and it looks like he's on a stage. But the thing is, there's no there's no spectators. Or at the end, when Robert is in the exact same position, looks like a stage, a performance, also in the dark, but this time people are listening. There's an audience there, and, and of course he tells how Andre was killed, but he lies about how he was killed. And there's one uh, character in this film who, you know, because we see all of these various rich people uh, coming to the chateau, and there's this one older uh, gentleman, aristocrat, you know, bourgeois type, who is just terrible. I mean, you know, because <laughs> he has one of the last lines of the film where after Andre, you know, says what happens and, oh, there was a tragedy, he was killed, accident. Uh, sorry, when uh, Robert says, oh, this is a tragedy, Andre was killed, it was an accident, and uh, one of the guys, one of the other, you know, because throughout the film, people are sort of talking behind each other's backs, uh, gossiping about all these things that are happening. And one guy goes, oh, yeah, yeah, right, an accident. And then the other older gentleman says, no, no, you see, Robert, he's got class. It's like the people who, who lie have class. That's classy. He earlier says after during the hunting scene, he's talking about someone who accidentally shot themselves and died 20 minutes later. And he's laughing his ass off about it. Again, it's this this theme and these feelings of people disconnected from others, not caring about others, not seeing the humanity of others, not having compassion for others, not having empathy for others, just wrapped up in, in their own world. And so, again, at the Chateau, that's when chaos ensues. That's when all hell uh, breaks loose uh, because we have our love triangle and then we have another love triangle, two love triangles, between uh, Lisette uh, Marceau and Schumacher. So uh, the... Lisette and Schumacher work for uh, Robert and Christine. They're, you know, two of the servants. They have a team of servants. And uh, Marseille was someone that you see in the first hunting scene who was killing rabbits. And so he was he was doing it. Uh, he says he's doing it because he needed it for food for his sick, his sick mother. And so he gets caught. Uh, but Robert takes a liking to him, and so and he what he says is that he wants to work inside the house. He wants to be what he calls a domestic. And one thing that was really interesting in this movie was that the servants are envious of the rich people. It's not what you thought, you, what you think. Whether that it doesn't matter whether that's realistic or not. But it's it's uh, um, it's it's interesting to me because it's usually when when I've seen stories about the you know we have the rich and the poor together, servants and their masters. Uh, you know the servants say very little, and they're they're usually um, there to do their job and s serve their purpose. And the maybe the rich people are more uh, moody and snobbish and things like that. But here we get more of an inside look at the servants, and we see them even uh, having uh, dinners together. And it gets to the point where you I can't even tell who are the rich people and who are the servants because they're all so envious of of the rich people particularly Lee Set, who says that she would rather get divorced than leave Christine, Christine who she works for. I mean, everything is her love of Christine and how great Christine is. I felt that was really interesting. The only time you got a sense that some of the people who worked for the rich people sort of were criticizing them or thought that the rich people were snobs was that there's a there's this one character who comes and tells uh, with Christine and says that goes to the chefs and says I need you to uh, make uh, this woman's meal a certain way she doesn't want salt she only wants sea salt and don't add the sea salt until after the meal is done <laughs> <clears throat> And the chef actually rolls his eyes. And then later with another chef, they're cooking and he says to him, oh, wait, you you, you got to only add sea salt. And then he says, no, I don't care. That's just an obsession. And so that was the one of the few times where these characters uh, seem to roll their eyes at what they what they saw. But that same chef who I was like, I love this guy, you know, he's he's sticking his nose at this this woman's. Uh, insane demands about sea salt. Right after that, though, he uh, the someone brings up a Jewish person, and he goes in there and starts to talk about how Jewish people uh, eat like pigs. And so again, we're seeing the root of anti-Semitism. 
And 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 what's interesting about the racism that that people uh, say here is that these racist remarks is that it's all done casually. And the, the approach to the film is a very casual approach. Uh, he doesn't cut to someone telling anyone that, oh, what you just said is terrible. Uh, how dare you be racist? It's all just he says it and then the camera pans over to the next person. And so this this feeling of casualness is so strong. I mean, the film has such an energy and because of the farce, you just get really swept up in the feelings, which to me is probably more important than, under, than understanding it in, in a way or, or trying to uh, review it as best you can like I am. <laughs> but what I found so fascinating about that was that when these people make racist remarks, no one tells them that they're wrong. No one says, how can you say that? It's just normal. It's, it's as if someone just said, oh, it's uh, raining outside. It, no one cares. It's all absolutely normal. And there are different remarks like that throughout the film, which I'll, which I'll get into. But this, this love triangle that ensues, which is very, very funny, is that uh, Lisette and Marseille begin to flirt with each other. They start to kiss. And so Schumacher, uh, Schumacher who already doesn't like Marceau, catches them. And, you know, throughout the whole film, he's trying to chase uh, Marseille down and kill him. I mean, at one point he's shooting <laughs> in, in the middle of the, the party, he's shooting, op- takes his gun and starts shooting at him and, and missing and everything. And it's very, very funny. And it's funny because later uh, Robert says to everybody, I think the servants got a little excited tonight, <laughs> like a little excited. But at the same time, uh, he, he seems to blame all of the chaos that happens purely on the servants, where at the same time, he and Andre were getting into this massive fist fight but it's like, no, no, it's the servants that, that went a little too far, uh, not me, because he's, quote unquote, uh, the classy one. But what's interesting is that he, he as much as he's using satire here or force, farce, he could have went all the way Renoir and just made, I mean, they're pretty awful, but he does humanize them to an extent. Uh, he does give them moments of consciousness. I already talked about Christine, who's probably more, more conscious of wrongdoings than anyone, but even... Uh, Robert at a certain point he's talking to Marseille later and he talks and he says uh, that he's hurting women and and he shouldn't hurt women and and it's terrible of him and so he is aware but then he on the flip side says something racist immediately after that which is he goes if I was only an Arab if I was only an because they know how to not hurt women and men it's like well how do you (laughs) again it's like how do you know that he says something like that uh, about how they're they're better at with their relationships and it's like again you see how he's grouping uh a religion or people from a different country he's he's grouping them as one way of being as one way of thinking which of course is racist it's awful of him and so he has that throughout the film Renoir where someone may be sensible at a certain point and likable uh, and then saying something to con- to contradict what you just thought about them, like I said with the chef, and now with uh, Robert, and so the that that happens uh, with Christine as well, who, uh, of course, during the hunting scene, uh, they uh, her I, I believe it's her niece who says to her, "Hey, did you do you uh, do you like?" Or someone says, "Do you like hunting?" And she goes, "Meh." You know, <laughs> she's she's just there because everyone's doing it, and so you got to just join in and shoot all these rapids down which is such a terrible uh terrible scene and when when you watch that again i can't help but think of the holocaust of jewish people getting shot for sport in the street and for nothing and uh being laughed at and again it's unbelievable this the the atrocities uh that happened uh and that we see renoir seem to anticipate that and what bazin says in his book is that renoir uh, was able to, he was so sensitive to to the times all, always and to people and to society that he was able almost to predict what was to come and to anticipate things. And we see that in this film, whereas some people are incredible at uh, looking at the past in, in, his, in history and put it on screen um, and express and have an understanding of the past. He can, he can, he can go the other way where he can anticipate things that that were to come. And so this film um, is timeless in that sense, because even though this has to do uh, clearly with the society at this time, I already mentioned the connection with the technology that Robert 
uh, and the others have and how much that is connected to people on their phones today. And and really, at the end of the day, we all have sides of ourselves who are that are superficial. We all have sides that, of ourselves that are apathetic to some uh, situation, one situation or another that we probably should be more um empathetic and compassionate about uh we all sort of get lost in our own worlds and and don't really pay attention to others uh we all have a a part of us that has a a need to to look good and and a certain vanity but this film is 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 all about that uh to to an extreme you know of course with the farce and so we 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 really see that in this film and it and it really for me hits a nerve not just uh on this time that he is depicting but just with people uh, in general and i feel that's why this film is timeless you can watch it again and again because not only is it so entertaining it is it is so uh, uh it is so full of details and these and the conversations are are very brief and one thing that bazine says which is fascinating to me is that uh, you'll be looking at one thing, but because all of these these uh, these uh, pl- uh, you know various love triangles things are all happening at the same time in the chateau, he he's he starts on one uh, two people and they leave through a door and then he pans to the next story. But what's happening is that 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 other story is happening at the same time. And what's really fascinating to me is that when we watch movies, uh, you know. Pro- almost 100% of the time or if not 100% of the time what you're watching in the, what you're watching on the screen screen is what's happening right now and all your attention is on that but in this case because all these things are happening at once there's a whole life happening outside of the frame and we see that uh so many times in this film like i said starting on one conversation and going to the next going to the next uh, one guy's chasing another guy, uh, and it's all happening at the same time. Whereas we, you know, you look at a filmmaker like Paul Thomas Anderson, he has uh, in some of his films uh, different stories, but they're all they're all separated. They're all different stories that have some kind of a connection. Uh, so when one goes to the other, um, we're not worrying about the other one because you get a sense that we're going to go back. But in this case, these things are all happening at the same time in the same place. Uh, there's just to illustrate my point. There's during the uh, performance at a certain, uh, you know, they're, they're putting on all these shows and things like that. And he, it's, it's in the dark and the camera starts on Christine and this guy who's trying to pick her up. And she's like, Oh, I drank too much. And he says, Oh, ooh, good, good. You know, um, he's trying to pick her up. Clearly the camera pans over to Schumacher and Lisette and uh, Marseille and they're kissing. And then Schumacher sees, you know, is on to them. And then we pan over to Andre, who sees Christine with this new guy flirting and and all these things. And and so we go to these three different things that are happening all at the same time. And so we're wondering all about them, even though the camera may be on Andre. But but at the same time, we're thinking, well, what's going on in the background there? And the background is not just background like we see in a lot of films and television shows where the where, you know, yeah, there are probably little stories in the background but we're we're not we're not worried about it or concerned with it because it's not the focus focal point that's just there to create the atmosphere and to make it believable so if you're in a restaurant obviously there's going to be people in a restaurant so you can't people are not necessarily always conscious of that when they're watching a film like how important the background is just to 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 make it believable but in this sense also, because Renoir is using deep focus, he's interested in everything in the frame. Even if those characters are in the in the background, uh, because he's using deep focus, we can see them. And so we know there's a whole story going on there that we're going to get back to, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully at a certain point. Uh, but it's fascinating to me because he didn't want to break all the action up. He wanted to see the characters move. He wanted to see them interact. And so... You know, I don't know how he did this without it being a big mess, because like I said, you've got tons of characters. uh, You've got these these stories going on at the same time and the camera uh, moving often panning from one story to the other. And it's not distracting. It is totally seamless. Uh, He's got these long hallways where it'll start on one side of the hallway and then pan all the way to the other side. 
That is really hard to do. For people who think that that just sounds like a quote-unquote filmed play and they just rolled the camera, absolutely not. Because that has to be blocked perfectly, it has to be lit perfectly, it has to be timed perfectly. That is really difficult. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a point just reviewing this where I feel like I can go on and on and on. I mean, there are so many details. I just want to mention the performances. Uh, it, they seem to be ahead of their time in, in acting on film um, being at, here in France because it is all so realistic. Whereas in, in American filmmaking, you had some actors in the 30s who were realistic on camera, but it wasn't really until the 40s and 50s where we started to see really truthful, realistic acting uh, you know, Stanislavski, the method approach, getting to America in the late 20s, it had first an influence more on theater and then had more of an influence on film. So where these actors learned how to be so real, I don't know. At the same time, I know Renoir was incredible with actors, so I'm sure that helped. And he would begin by having them, you know, if they were rehearsing or just reading from the script, flat they just did it flat he didn't want them to plan anything and that is the best way to begin don't plan anything and have it come organically so he was able to find a way to get them to be so so real and there's a great moment that uh marseille has uh where <laughs> when he gets caught by Schumacher uh killing some of the rabbits earlier in the film and and he's and then he says oh he says to robert i needed it for my sick mother and then Schumacher says, you don't have a sick mother. He doesn't have a sick mother. And then he says, I don't have a sick mother. I don't have a sick mother. And it comes, it's so much better in French. <laughs> but it comes right out of his gut. And it is so real and so spontaneous. And I think, wow, 1939, ahead of its time. Uh, I just wanted to touch a little more on Octave. And again, Renoir plays Octave. Absolutely phenomenal and funny and passionate. And he's like that in life too when you hear him. Uh, talk he is so passionate about everything he says and he brings that into this film and he's in other uh, of his films as well and so he's sort of this mediator between uh tr these two love triangles trying to help everybody out sort everything out um he is uh friends with andre we see early in the film that andre uh, is so devastated that Christine wasn't there that he tries to commit suicide while, while Octave is in the car with him. And Octave says, you know, you're going on radio and you're saying all this stuff about Christine. He goes, you're, in other words, you're breaking the rules because she's a society woman and you don't do that. In other words, you don't tell the truth. Um, but what Christine says to Octave is that uh, they that she just uh, you know was friendly with him and maybe he got the impression that they were in love. So again, is that a lie or is that true? Later on, she is ready to run away with him. So we don't know whether she's telling the truth or not. But uh, Octave is this relationship with Christine is also interesting because he says that they're like sister and brother. And Andre thinks that Octave is also in love with her. And he says, no, no, she's like my sister. But what you find is obviously that's clearly true. Uh, as later on, you know, she hugs him. They lie down on the bed. He seems to be enjoying it. He says to her, you can't just be hugging people like a 12-year-old girl. Like you're going to give people the wrong impression. And later on, uh, when she, once she sees that Robert has cheated on her and she approaches uh, Genevieve, and this is another interesting scene because what she says is, well, this is my opportunity to now go do a little of my own uh, uh, cheating with men. Uh, now, you don't know if she's covering up that she's hurt or not. The, the guys I, I, I reviewed this with a couple of days ago, they felt that she actually was truly hurt and that she was covering up her feelings. I think that in part she was hurt, but I don't believe that she actually really loved Robert. I think... Uh, she she was with him clearly for uh, his money. Also says about Andre that, oh, she doesn't want to be with him because he's too sincere and sincere people are a bore. So again, these contradictions and this conflict she has about uh, people who are, you know, she clearly wants family and, and children, but yet she doesn't want to be with anyone sincere. It's this conflict between consumerism and love, uh, I suppose. But Renoir describes her as a complete romantic. And so what ends up happening is she first uh, was about to sleep with one guy in the chateau. Uh, Andre gets into a fight with that guy. Then she says that she loves Andre. She wants to run away from him. 
but he, again, because he stops and is again, he's true. He's a truth teller, and his rules of the game are to tell the truth. And so he wants to go and tell the husband what's going on, and she's like, "Let's just run away," because her rules of the game are lies. That's how I took it, anyways. And so she uh, then goes off with Octave, and he's being so open about his failures, uh, about all the things, uh, how much she loved. He loved her, um, her father. And, and now she says, I love you, actually. And that's, of course, where the, you know, the irony of the end is that when, when, when they're outside um, and we see later Schumacher is following them, again, it's like Shakespeare, it's a case of mistaken identity. Uh, he thinks that it's Lisette because she's, because Christine is wearing the jacket that he bought for Lisette. And so he thinks that it is Octave with Lisette. He's ready to shoot him. And sure enough, um, when we see later on the, he leaves Octave, he's going to run away from her. He runs into Andre and he gives Andre the coat and says, she's waiting for you, uh, outside. And so Andre comes out and he's the one who gets shot. And what's also interesting is that Schumacher, clearly a German name. It's the German who kills Andre, the, the truth, the truth teller, the, the sort of angel of the film. Uh, who, who, who always tells the truth. And I, I don't think it was a coincidence that it was a German character who uh, did, does it. But even, but even Schumacher, like I was saying about the humanizing of these characters, he even, you know, you feel for him because his wife's cheating on him. All he wants to do is be with his wife. Uh, they can't even live together because he works at the Chateau and she works uh, in the house with, uh, works for Christine. And she doesn't, you know, she's brushing him off. She clearly doesn't like him anymore. And he is truly heartbroken. Uh, he gets fired, of course, for shooting at, <laughs> in the house at Marseille. And uh, it's a great performance from uh, Gaston Mandol. And he's, you know, he's weeping. And so you do feel for him. But then again, it's like I said with these characters, you can feel for them and then boom, they can turn on a dime and do something awful. Just like people in life. I mean, it's really... Renoir just man this film I can talk about this film all here I am 50 minutes into this review I could talk about this film all day I, I bet you I can see it again tomorrow and see so much more and want to do a second review on this uh I my only concern is I'm gonna I'm gonna miss things which I surely am but it's just brilliant the things that he can do with farce with comedy with impressionism with satire uh but yet not just make it a genre piece. I mean, it's easy to, we've seen farces and they're, you know, plot heavy and they're fun. Here's a, a, a farce that is so much about humans and so much about the times. And, and again, like I said, it makes this film so timeless because it holds up so well because this type, look at politics in the last 10 years. This type of behavior is happening uh, again and again and again. Man, Renoir is a genius. I'm going to stop it there. I can go on and on at this point. I'm losing my voice <laughs> because of my passion for the rules of the game. Um, what a wonderful film. You know, I'm so glad that I was able to review it today and review it on the uh, Projection Booth podcast. I'll let people know when that review is out if you're interested in, in hearing it. It's an audio podcast. It's, again, one of my favorite podcasts. So if you haven't checked out the Projection Booth, you can find it on any audio podcast platform. Thank you so much. If you've seen this film, comment below and let me know what you think. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon or just leaving a donation, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. You can also leave a donation directly here to my YouTube channel by clicking the thanks link, which you will see right beside the like and dislike comments. It's shaped in a heart. Uh, just click on that. And then from there, if you'd like, you can leave a donation directly to the channel. Thank you again. If this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left. In just a second, just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes. Thank you again, everyone. And I will see you in the next episode.